ready. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session with Stephen Staples. I'd like to introduce you to our uh, speaker today. He is a, a very well-known chairperson of PeaceQuest. He's an accomplished policy and research strategist who has been around for 25 years, a published author, award-winning peace and social justice advocate. So Mr. Staples is the owner of Public Response, which is a digital agency that services nonprofit organizations and also trade unions. He has a lot of experience with a wide range of leaders, including Nobel laureate uh, Jody Williams, the former US Senator Tom Hayden, Senator Romeo Dallaire. He has worked uh, with Council of Canadians Chairperson Maude Barlow, Unifor President Jerry Diaz, and Ontario Federation of Labour President Sid Ryan. He is the founder of the Rideau Institute, a nonprofit independent research advocacy and consulting group based in Ottawa that specializes in defense and foreign affairs policy. Its public engagement arm is ceasefire.ca. So you can go to that uh, site and learn a great deal. He's a board member of the Nobel Prize winning International Peace Bureau. This is a large uh, peace net network that you might be interested in joining as well. And he is also serving the, uh, consecutive terms on the Members Council of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. In 2018, he was elected to the Board of Directors of the Council of Canadians. So he will be addressing us today in this on-demand lecture, but he's also available on Friday, June the 4th. If you would like to attend, uh, we will be having a chair, Dr. Frederick Pearson, who is the Executive Director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at Wayne State in Detroit. And then we will replay this uh, short presentation. And then Doc, uh, Mr. Staples will be there as the uh, uh, speaker. And then we will have a Q&A, which will be in the networking lounge. So this session is sponsored by PeaceQuest. You can see the URL there. Um, and that's the Leadership and Education Initiative. So I wanted to help to engage students and teachers and Canadians in peace research so I'll turn now to uh, Steve and thank you again, Steve, for coming on and for uh, helping us to understand the initiatives that you've been undertaking over the last decades that I've appreciated observing. And thank you so much for, for talking to us. My pleasure. Thanks, Professor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Frederick Pearson, for organizing and hosting this uh, session today. And I wanna thank the CPRA uh, organization for uh, inviting me to give this presentation of some of the research that I've been doing. And I'm delighted this is my first time at the Congress for Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, a meeting I've heard many times, but I've never actually had the opportunities to um, participate. So I'm, I'll make a lot of uh, first time gaffes, if that's okay. Please forgive me as, as I go along. Of course, everybody's doing that now, having to do all these events online, which is a completely other thing as well. So it's additionally complicated. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to be speaking with the CPRA uh, today and sharing some of the work that I've done. As Professor Simpson mentioned, I've had a long career working in, in the nonprofit sector uh, in, in a number of uh, social movements, uh, both the labor, anti-corporate globalization, and then the, in the peace movement as well and um, uh, have um, always had an interest in education. And at this point in my career, I have used uh, my recent studies for my uh, master's program, uh, which is a master's of leadership and community engagement at York University to further explore some of this work, uh, to put some theoretical underpinnings to various activities that I have been doing for many, many years and, um, and finding a way uh, uh, forward. And so, of course, usually in, in looking for, everybody's doing the pivot right now, right? Pivot is the operative word, and we're, we're pivoting in many ways. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm pivoting not only in dealing with this uh, pandemic, uh, my career, uh, but also pursuing my own work in social justice has been pivoting towards working more with youth, working more with um, uh, education as well, and, and peace education, which is not something that I've traditionally done. I'm more of a policy guy. Uh, having worked at the Rito, founded the Rito Institute in 2006, 
uh, in Ottawa and, you know, being involved in, you know, um, uh, hand to hand combat, so to speak, on Parliament Hill for so many years. And now I'm involved in a very kind of different, uh, different project, which I want to tell you about some research uh, that we just completed. In fact, this is sort of preliminary findings of work that we're doing on an ongoing project. So I'm just going to share my screen. So this, uh, this study is called Peace and Social Justice Education and Engagement Strategies in the COVID-19 Context. So this is prepared by me as part of my capstone project for the Masters of Leadership and Community Engagement. And I also uh, worked with a, um, a, a very important uh, a colleague, uh, Katie Gingrich, who, uh, who assisted me in putting this work uh, together and whom I owe a debt as my colleague on this. So the, go the goals of the project were um, uh, very straightforward. One, the first one was to understand the interrelationships between nonprofits, teachers, and school boards in delivering peace and social justice education. The second goal was to improve nonprofits' peace and social justice education programs. And the third goal was to assist teachers in providing peace and social justice education for students. Of course, all of these goals will be pursued with a special emphasis on how health and safety measures, uh, uh, how, how all of this is affected by health and safety uh, measures to address the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So this is the, the um, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of a background and provide you some context for the research. So two years ago, I became chairperson of PeaceQuest, which Professor Simpson mentioned about. This is an organization that was founded in 2012 in Kingston, and it was an organization that had four streams, uh, policy, uh, interfaith work, the arts, and education. And uh, it was a, uh, for five years, they did a campaign that focused a lot on, on peace education. And when I became chairperson, I was kind of tasked with taking it to the next stage. Well, it led me to ask a number of, uh, a number of questions uh, about the nature of the relationship between peace groups and social movements, which I've been part of, but how, do, how it engages with the education system, being teachers and school boards. And um, there's a, a very rich discussion to be had in the relationships between these. So um, the outcome of the project that I had hoped for uh, was uh, to develop a strategy uh, for NGOs and nonprofits to use in pursuing peace education and social justice programs. The process that developed was, was very interesting. Uh, so we had to develop a process where we could, where we could uh, speak to uh, people and we used a, a community-based uh, uh, research approach. Uh, so we held a special meeting on pieces with peace and social justice educators to discuss the challenges we are all facing collectively and to share ideas and strategies to continue our work during the pandemic. In part, this was informed by some experiences that I learned when I was working with PeaceQuest, just to return to that briefly. PeaceQuest, during its very uh, active time period, created an entire website of curriculum resources for teachers called warnchildren.com. It's a wonderful resource of lesson plans, videos, all kinds of things in it, um, but they were very disappointed uh, that they were not able to find um, uh, a large take up for the resources, that it wasn't used as much as they had anticipated uh, by teachers, which, as I mentioned, raised a number of questions about me about, well, where do teachers find resources? What are some of the challenges to teachers that want to do peace education? Um, uh, what are the obstacles that they have to, uh, to overcome? Uh, what does the research say about peace education and, and working with uh, teachers? On the flip side is, you know, where do NGOs fit into all this? How do NGOs or third party groups even interact, whether it be peace or any other issue with an educational system that has its own curriculum, that has, that has its own um, uh, you know, school boards and its own structures? Uh, how does that in interaction actually function? Um, and then how, uh, you know, do teachers need support? Um, and is there a positive uh, thing that, that NGOs can even provide for them? 
So we held this meeting and we brought together 20 participants, including people from the uh, NGO world, from the nonprofit world, uh, but also a number of teachers um, and uh, experts that work in the school boards. Some people have expertise actually uh, designing curriculum. Uh, other people work in community partnerships between uh, school boards. Uh, so we had, uh, but basically they're all practitioners in one way or another uh, in, uh, in peace and, and social justice education. Um, and we, um, while we um, selected this, uh, this group, um, uh, they, they all identified with uh, the idea of peace and social justice education. They self-identified with it in, in whatever, whatever way it made sense to them. So we had three essential questions when we uh, brought this group together. What are the critical challenges that need to be addressed? What are the gaps in our knowledge? And what opportunities do we have? And so these questions were put to them. This was a meeting that we held on November 17th uh, of, uh, of 2020. You know, this is the height of the second wave. So all of this is done in the context of, of, uh, of COVID-19. So from that discussion, uh, we identified 32 responses, 32 pieces of input from the discussion, which we parsed and coded into three different themes. Identified these themes and looking at the inputs in, in, in three, in three uh, ways. The first was curriculum, uh, which I thought was the what and why of, of peace education. Looks at curriculum design, what are learning outcomes. The second theme was pedagogy or the how of the teaching of peace education. What are the various teaching approaches? What are the resources that are used? The third one was a new one that, that using a community-based participatory research approach uh, was generated from the discussion, which I had not uh, considered going in, but uh, would demonstrates the benefit of using this kind of approach, was professional development, was the who involved in peace education, engaging the community, learning from each other. A number of comments came from this. This is all on the way to try to find strategy, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the discussion. So I'll just share with you some of the things that we learned. So in looking at the curriculum, the what and why of peace education, and you remember our three questions, which we looked at challenges, knowledge gaps, and opportunities, uh, this is what we learned. So from the challenges, peace education is not explicit in the curriculum. Teachers have a difficult time in finding where to attach peace education work in the, in the required curriculum that they have to uh, uh, deliver. Um, uh, there's challenges of definition. Different people have diff different definitions of what peace education uh, is. And for uh, even in some people, there's a, a bit of an issue fatigue that we have, an issue fatigue that teachers described, which was interesting. So there was a number of knowledge gaps identified as well too. So where does it fit in the curriculum? Uh, there's a lack, this lack of clarity around what peace education actually is, um, that we needed a clear definition. Um, again, from the, from the community-based participatory research, this um, restorative justice was a theme that came up under the terms of peace education. This was an element that, uh, that came up quite frequently. So what is that by definition? Is it the same as peace education? How, how are they the same and how are they different? Also, how to make peace education culturally responsive. This is an important theme in, in education right now, um, and uh, peace education needs to, to adhere to this. Uh, but we also identified plenty of opportunities. You can see that the font is much smaller in this section because there was a lot more discussion on this, thankfully. Mm. There's an appetite for people to know what's going on around them. The people are using social media. Uh, a number of organizations are hosting dynamic, engaging presentations in the form of workshops. Uh, there's an element of how we might listen to what, what students want instead of prescribing what we as adults think they want. Uh, using so many rich teachable moments such as Black Lives Matter and other opportunities that could be used to, to connect to, to peace education. Um, and where do we connect it in the curriculum from, from K to 12? Looking at 
pedagogy or the how of, of peace education, a number of issues emerged. The need to create safe space for dialogue in terms of challenges, a lack of understanding of how adults can speak with students about these sometimes very difficult uh, issues. Uh, other people were looking for a clearinghouse of resources, how difficult it is to find uh, peace education resources. And then what kind of quality is ascribed to these? Even further, you know, the potential for providing uh, an evaluative uh, process um, or, uh, for, uh, for, um, for peace education resources, because uh, the, no the amount of great material that's available out there is, is, is quite uh, varied. Um, how to adapt hand-on exercises to the virtual space now that so much teaching is being used. And, and NGOs are doing this very uh, successfully now in taking what were previous workshops, hands-on workshops, and adapting the pedagogy to the online environment, which obviously requires a, a different approach. But how do you even access teachers in schools as, as a nonprofit when you can't even get, when you can't even enter the school because of health and safety uh, requirements? Uh, knowledge gaps, uh, hub or library of teaching uh, resources, uh, what are the best resources, how to get it into schools, diversity and range of peace resources that are out there, and understanding how uh, to best deliver peace education often depends on the audience. For opportunities, how can we use this time period of COVID to prepare? How can we create educators, uh, how creative educators have been working to synthesize examples of anti-racism education, for instance, into areas such as math, which gets back to the curriculum question, finding areas where you can bring these issues in into unlikely areas. One wouldn't think that you can do peace education in, in the math context, but you can. Um, uh, can we create new resources? How can we leverage technology in terms of our leaning? One can imagine all kinds of opportunities with guest speakers that where Zoom, the Zoom platform has become so ubiquitous, all kinds of opportunities uh, emerge from that. The third theme I'll, 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 I'll wrap up on is professional development, is the who. So there's challenges, educators knowledge or lack thereof. Uh, this is very interesting because as many people have commented in the peace education area, they, re they refer back to a time when there was a lot of peace education going on in the 80s and the 90s and early 2000s. There was a lot of government funding for it and then it disappeared. It, the funding ended and this whole area began to, to give way. Well, now today's teachers were the students of 10, 15 years ago. And we are reaping what was sown at that point where we hear the constant comment from, from early service teachers is we don't know this stuff. We don't know this stuff because they were never taught it because peace education was largely absent for the last 15, 20 years. And so that is a real challenge in terms of working with teachers to feel confident with addressing uh, the uh, the information, and of course, um, uh, you know, it's I love this comment of how to make peace and social justice work feel like it's not an add-on, it's not extra work because obviously teachers are very stressed right now. They don't want extra work, so it's got to be integrated in knowledge gaps. How do teachers hear about peace education content opportunities? How can we help uh, teachers? Uh, they're already overloaded, so how do we make it accessible? How do we make it fit? Um, there are lots of groups out there doing fantastic work in terms of nonprofits. How do we help build those relationships between teachers and community groups? There's plenty of opportunities to learn about each other. We can focus on mental well wellness. We can do online uh, training. Teacher training actually became a, a very important theme about a lot of peace education may not be just building resources or even dealing with, with students. It could be just dealing with teachers in order to promote peace education uh, in the schools. And the central question is how can we bring peace educators together who are passionate about peace and justice? So from those th three themes and, and this input, we developed, we tried to develop a strategy which was the prescribed outcome. Uh, how can we use this time period of COVID to prepare and adjust for recovery? This was very clear that we're not gonna get much done during this time period, but we can be ready for when the recovery happens. Um, there could be myriad ways to engage in-class workshops, teacher-student resources, teachers' professional development. And amongst the participants that we were talking to, when we did post-event surveys with them, we found that there was a large interest in future co collaboration uh, among participants. And so um, we suggested as an ongoing strategy that 
Well, we decided that the outcome was not really a strategy. It was not going to be a written document that we thought that we would just share with everybody, but it was actually a process. That was the outcome of it, it was a process. That's the strategy. And so we suggested that we would build a piece of social justice education community of practice. Uh, we would initiate a participant-led process to support those engaged in peace and social justice education and establish a community of practice for peace and justice teachers. We would find people that have a mutual interest in peace and social justice education. We would support each other through regular engagement and we promote innovative uh, in teach innovation in teaching and learning. And as you know, the community of practice is a very good model. It's a very good theoretical framework that's being used very widely now. It was developed by Etienne Wegner in the 1990s, and um, it has a domain practice and community. And um, you may recall this very brief definition that communities of practice are groups of people who share a concern or a passion for something that they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. Those are the th three main parts of a community of practice. And so we have uh, proposed uh, working together uh, with people in developing a community of practice. I'm a member of several community practices, uh, and this is a new one, and we are just getting started now, or it being early 2021. We're holding quarterly meetings. We're potentially holding an annual conference. We'll look at a, a resource, a hub of resource uh, and providers with reviews. We may develop a newsletter, speakers workshops, a network of collaboration and mentorships for new teachers. And we will continue to use the community-based approach uh, to see what is generated by the group. We're not going to go in with a, a pre-written uh, list of things, but we have think that this model, a community of practice for peace and social justice education, uh, is something that's going to be worthwhile, that can grow, and the outcome will be improved peace education uh, for, for students in Ontario. And that's the end of my presentation. Wow, thank you, Steve. Thanks very much. That's very interesting. I thought that was super fascinating. It's like I'm there at the beginning of the building of a, a huge new network on uh, peace for teachers um, and also for all sorts of other uh, career uh, activists like lawyers or anyone who's interested in pursuing peace education on their own because of their own life experiences. So I hope that this network is, is developed. Now, is it gonna spread out from Toronto where you're based and, and where will you get some money for it? I, I'm curious in, to find out all these things, but um, we only have a short time together. And so these are the sorts of questions that people might have if they come to the actual Canadian peace research uh, session that we'll be holding. Um, and to repeat myself on that, it'll, it'll, uh, I'll just share a screen one more time. Um, just to remind people, if you're interested in pursuing this uh, fascinating area of discussion, we're going to be talking on Friday, June the 4th. We'll also be talking throughout the uh, conference with many educators uh, who are, are going to be helping out on that. So um, uh, here's the information, session five, lecture hall, Friday, June the 4th, 2021. And that's an opportunity to engage again with Steve Staples here on his ideas about peace education uh, during COVID and, and once the COVID is over. So take a look at that. I'm gonna uh, stop the share there and go back here. And thank you very much, Steve, very much. I uh, can't do a round of applause, but I'm sure there will be one uh, later. Thanks so much, great to be here.